Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of The Trouble with Goats and Sheep by Joanna Cannon. So I picked this up because I know it's Charlie Heathcote here on YouTube, it's his favourite book, and she's his favourite author, or one of the favourites anyway. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my many tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Summer 1976. Mrs. Creasy is missing and the avenue is alive with whispers. As the summer shimmers endlessly on, ten-year-olds Grace and Tilly decide to take matters into their own hands. But as doors and mouths begin to open and the cul-de-sac starts giving up its secrets, the amateur detectives will find more than they could have imagined. Dun dun dun. So, it's good to start, by the way, it's got this nice little uh, map of the street, which is very cool. And all the chapters are dated and kind of in explains which house on the avenue is... Um, Lots of great lines in this one, such as this. Uh, my mother said I was at an awkward age. I didn't feel especially awkward, so I presume she meant that it was awkward for them. I normally don't like books that are kind of narrated by younger characters, but I, I think it worked here. We get a reference to Dandelion and Burdock and uh, Penguin Bars, which are very British sweets and, uh, well, chocolate bars and drinks. We get this little exchange. He doesn't look like a murderer, said Tilly. What does a murderer look like? They usually have moustaches, she said and are much fatter. It's in the middle of a heat wave and we get, I looked at the sky which sat like an ocean above our heads. It wouldn't rain for another 56 days. And when I was reading this, we were in the middle of a heat wave here in the UK as well. And one that actually was hotter than the, the one that's happening in this book. Mr. Forbes says, people do strange things in this kind of weather. That's it, said Eric Lamb. It will be the heat. And Tilly later on asks, why do people blame everything on the heat? It's easier, I said. Easier than what? Easier than telling everyone the real reasons. So this is funny because I've known people that have had like policies like this on their bathroom, but it comes in particularly because of the uh, heat wave. So I just want to read this paragraph here. No one realised then that in many years to come, people will still speak of this summer, that every other heat wave would be compared to this one, and those who lived through it would shake their heads and smile whenever anyone complained of the temperature. It was a summer of deliverance, a summer of space hoppers and dancing queens, when Dolly Parton begged Jolene not to take her man, and we all stared at the surface of Mars and felt small. We had to share bathwater and half fill the kettle, and we were only allowed to flush the toilet after what Mrs Morton described as a special occasion. The only problem was, it meant that everyone knew when you'd had a special occasion, which was a bit awkward. Mrs. Morton said we'd end up with buckets and standpipes if we weren't careful, and she was part of a vigilante group who reported anyone for watering their gardens in the dark. Mrs. Morton used washing up water, which was allowed. It will only work if we all pull together, she said. I knew this wasn't true, mind you, because unlike the brittle yellow of everyone else's, Mr. Forbes's lawn remained a strangely suspicious shade of green. And um, as I say, it's been hotter this summer than it was that summer in question. They get a visit from a policeman who says, routine inquiries. And we go, I thought I would like a job where inquiring about everyone else's private business was considered perfectly routine. And we get this great little bit. Perhaps she was thinking of going back to where she used to live. My father put a hand on Mr. Creasy's shoulder. Walsall, was it? Or Sutton Coldfield? Tamworth, said Mr. Creasy. She hasn't been back for six years. Not since we married. She doesn't know anyone there now. So I was born in Sutton Coldfield and grew up in Tamworth until I went to university. And someone has a to-do list. It crossed over two pages in loops of blue ink, which thickened and smudged where the pen had stopped to think. As well as vacuuming the hall and putting out the dustbins, it had entries like clean teeth and eat breakfast. Do you put everything on your list, Mrs. Forbes? I started on my first fig roll. Oh yes, best not to leave anything to chance. It was Harold's idea. He says it stops me being slapdash. I have everything on my list as well, like take meds, uh, brush teeth, etc. And just this was interesting to me as someone who suffers from anxiety disorder. Distract yourself, that's what Margaret always told him. When you start getting anxious, give your mind something else to think about. He'd become an expert at distracting himself. he distracted himself so much, he found himself drowning in distractions, and all the little details in the world seemed to join up together in his head and make a whole new problem to worry about. So one thing that I learned that I didn't know is that Patsy Cline died in a plane crash when she was only 30, so I learned that. And I just thought this was interesting as well, this, this outlook. He had taken refuge behind a vase of flowers Margaret had placed on the windowsill. Margaret didn't believe in artificial flowers. She said there was too much fakery in the world as it was, without putting it in a jug and introducing it into your living room as well. They were fresh then, of course, but now we could smell it, the inevitable strange sweetness of decay that always seems to break through, no matter how much you might try to cover it up with all sorts of other smells. And we're trying to bend spoons like Yuri Gala, and someone says, I don't know how Yuri Gala does it. It's because he's Spanish, I said. Spanish people can do things like that. They can be quite clever. I'm pretty sure he's not Spanish. I assume he's Russian, but I don't know. And I just thought this was an interesting line, because this is very true, this is what people do. I've been guilty of this too. 
No one had ever listened to him before. They had only waited until he stopped speaking so they could burden him though with their own stories. And this paragraph I just thought was really beautifully written even though it is very sad as well. He hadn't set out to tell her, although when he went back over the conversation, it was obvious that it would happen. He had told her about the day they were given the diagnosis and how Elsie had said everything was going to be alright, and how her shoulders looked thin and worn out. He told her how Elsie paused after each sentence to give the consultant a space to put the hope, and how the consultant had stayed silent. There was no hope. The cancer was racing through her body as though it had a very important meeting to get to. He told Margaret Creasy about the hospital stays and the long corridors he walked alone, the nurses with gentle voices and tired eyes, the doctors who circled the wards without ever stopping. He told her how Elsie seemed to disappear into the pillows, how her hands were the only thing he could recognise, how her body seemed to be leaving before she did. He told Margaret Creasy about the day Elsie decided it was enough and the hospice they turned down and the bag of tablets they were sent home with. The hospital bed in the front room, the people who came to clean and wash and turn, the shame, the humiliation. He told her about the pain when the cancer found Elsie's bones, how he would listen to Elsie sobbing when she thought no one could hear. He told her how Elsie said if she had a gun she would shoot herself, how they had both looked at each other, how he would have done anything for Elsie. He told Margaret Creasy everything. He'd even shown her the handful of tablets which were left in the hospital carrier bag. Margaret had told him to drop them off at the pharmacist, but how could he when they would want to know what happened to the rest? Uh, I'll leave your imagination to fill in the, the gaps of uh, what happened there. We get this great little mini paragraph. I still hadn't learned the power of words how once they've left your mouth they have a breath and a life of their own. I had yet to realise that you no longer own them. I hadn't learned that once you've let them go, the words can then in fact become the owner of you. And this, I had an ex-girlfriend like this who loved to argue and I would never argue with her because I don't like arguing. I didn't have many arguments with people. In fact, Tilly and I never had arguments. Sometimes I tried but she would never join in. She would always say never mind or okay then or if you say so. And that was what I was. I was like Tilly. She was abusive though, so you know. And I just thought this was a nice bit of characterization. We sat in silence. I knew straight away that Walter Bishop was the kind of person you could sit in silence with. There were very few people like that I had found. Most grown-ups like to fill a silence with conversation. Not important, necessary conversation, but a spray of words that serve no purpose other than to cover up the quiet. But Walter Bishop was comfortable with saying nothing, and all I could hear as we sat together on that hot July day was the anxious cry of a wood pigeon, high up in one of the trees, calling for its mate. We get a reference to Hank Marvin and the Shadows. I freaking love the Shadows. Got a few of their records on vinyl. A little bit of deep philosophy here which will appeal to anyone who's ever used coping strategies to get through life. A coping strategy, Margaret Creasy had called it. The only problem was when your whole existence is something you have to cope with, you look back one day and find that your strategy has become a way of life. And um, some, uh, I think it's an Indian family moves in. And we get this which is very typical. It's almost a cliche by this point. So where are you from, my mother said. Amit was moulded into the end of the settee, his arms pressed to his sides like a soldier. Birmingham, he said. He sliced into the cake and his fork cracked against the plate. My mother leaned forward in a conspiracy. Yes, but where are you really from, she said. Amit leaned forward as well. Edge Baston, he said, and everyone laughed. My mother's laugh was a few seconds behind. We get this, you know, kind of casual racism here. Um, so Mr Forbes, he says, definitely multicultural. I'm a big fan of Sidney Poitier, for example. He is, said Mrs Forbes. And Louis Armstrong. Coloured people have got such a good sense of rhythm, haven't they? Being patriotic doesn't mean you're not open to new ideas, though. We just need to remember that Britannia rules the waves. People were like that for sure in the 70s, and unfortunately many of them still are. And they see, they see Jesus in a drain pipe, and we get this. He looks bloody miserable, though, doesn't he? She said. I always imagined that when I met Jesus, he'd be quite cheerful, said Tilly. I thought he'd wear a long smock and look people in the eye. Me too, I said. We both stared at the drain pipe. I, I tilted my head to one side. Perhaps he's having an off day. And we get this great line. Why on earth would the Lord God Almighty choose to perform a miracle on this avenue, said his mother. I doubt very much the vicar will even give Jesus the time of day. Then the vicar comes along. He says, uh, I don't think Jesus has ever dropped in on the East Midlands before. Um, and he stops. Uh, Mrs. Forbes applauds and then after a few seconds she stops and says, I do hope we're not going to be overrun with pilgrims. They'll make a terrible mess. Which reminded me of a James uh, Herbert book that I read, Shrine. Another really well written line here. Sometimes with grown ups, the gap between your question and their answer is too big, and it always seems like the best place to put all your worrying into. So they play Monopoly, and Mrs. Morton says, Don't we have to throw a six to start? Only Tilly bothers with that nonsense, I said, and landed on Whitechapel. Are you going to buy it? she said. 
And don't you have to go all the way around the board first before you can buy anything? And then they go back to the d drain pipe. I pointed to the drain pipe. Look at Jesus, I said to Tilly. Even he seems more unhappy than he did before. And then they won't let Walter Bishop have a look. Mrs. Roper spreads her arms and covers the drain pipe with the dimples. Jesus isn't here for just anyone, you know, she shouted. Isn't that rather the point? And the fact that that's rather the point is rather the point, you know? And Sheila goes, 82 degrees, 82 bloody degrees. How is anyone supposed to function in this bloody heat? We went over 100 during the heat wave here. All right, and then we have the acknowledgement and she thanks the staff at the George Bryan Center in Tamworth, which was very cool because again, I am from Tamworth. So overall, The Trouble with Goats and Sheep by Joanna Cannon is kind of like a literary fiction, semi-murder mystery novel that holds a mirror up to society and what it was like to be in Britain in the 1970s, especially in the Midlands. Uh, I thought it did a really good job. Uh, as you can tell, I enjoyed reading this. I enjoyed going back through it to read out some of my tabs as well. I gave this one a pretty strong 4 out of 5, maybe even a 4.5 out of 5. I can totally see why Charlie likes it so much. It's not going to be my favourite book ever, but definitely it will probably maybe <laughs> be in my favorites of the quarter we will see so there we have it that's what i made of the trouble with goats and sheep as always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit that subscribe button for more and i'll see you soon for another bunch video thanks a lot Bye bye